This is the Story Punks podcast, the show where we talk about all the punks, so steampunk, dieselpunk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. Today we're talking about dieselpunk and a little bit of steampunk. We're talking about comic art in reference to the Jekyll Island Chronicles, which is a fabulous comic put together by a team of creators that are called the Lost Mountain Mechanicals. So in this two-part series, we're going to cover some really wonderful things about what it's like to create a comic story. And then we're also going to talk about collaboration because this is a really unusually cohesive team. And you're really going to feel that as we go through these questions. And we're going to talk with all three of the Lost Mountain Mechanicals. So on the show with me for both of these episodes is Steve Nedvedek, Ed Crowell, and Jack Lowe. And I'm so thrilled. So in episode 37, we'll be talking about that process that they go through. And we'll be talking about definitions, of course, that's always where we start, and how that informs their process, how they get inspiration, and just how they approach creating this. And it's going to dip into talking about how their inspiration is collaboration. So that's what we'll focus on in the second part. So for episode 38, we'll be talking about collaboration and how they have made their team work. And honestly, they have some really cool insights. So I'm really excited to share that with you. I do want to tell you about a few things in the community, just in case you've missed them. I'll go really quickly because I've already mentioned these in previous episodes. We do have a StoryPunk salon session coming up on May 6th. So you can join us at 8 p.m. Central. As of this recording, it is on Facebook Live. I'm trying to get it on other channels as well. So don't be surprised if you see that pop up in announcements and such. But there are some really cool things about meeting together in person. The main thing is that I can get feedback from you on our amazing book club read. And that is Morlock Night by K.W. Jeter. And I also will be joined by a very amazing steampunk celebrity and doctor, Mike Pershawn, the steampunk scholar. He will be joining me and I couldn't be more thrilled. So don't miss that. And I am opening this up. So in my first recording that we did about two weeks ago, I had this in the Facebook group. I've actually opened that up from a closed group. I think people were having trouble clicking in, sharing it, and all kinds of things. So I want to definitely open this up. Now, it is a laboratory. So when you tune in there, you're going to see the raw conversation. And from the looks of it, it looks like I'm going to be editing these just so that it's a better experience when I post it to the podcast. But all those edits will be minimal. If you do want to see the behind the scenes or just, you know, whatever happens, then please join us there. But I really want you to be part of it. So if you do join us, just know that I will be showing things on screen and you may pop up there and you can be part of the Story Punks podcast. So Morlock Night is a pretty quick read. If you go through Audible, it's about six hours and that's pretty short. So I'm really excited. And again, this is by K.W. Jeter, who coined the term steampunk. So very relevant. And I hope you're excited to join me there. In keeping with our whole retro theme, especially this week as we're talking about diesel punk, I want to tell you about this really cool gift idea that I've come across. So this is old time candy, and you can tell from the name alone what we're talking about here. It's old fashioned and retro candy. And the thing I really liked as I checked this out was that you can order a decade box, which is super cool. So you can actually put in a decade, like the 1920s, the 1930s, etc., and you can have that gift box sent to someone. It's so nostalgic, and it's also, frankly, a really cool way to research some of the candy that was around. So even if all you do is go to this website and just research. What a cool way to see how old some of the candy we still have around today is. And also just some of the packaging and it's really, really a fun site. But if you do decide to order anything, 
I would ask that you please go through storypunks.world forward slash candy. That way I get a little bit of an affiliate boost and that really helps keep the podcast going as you know. So just a few other things on this site. You can also search by flavor, by candy type, by occasion, or you can just walk the virtual candy aisle. So Mother's Day is coming up as well. You can get a discount on candy and there's always some event that you'll see on their site where you can save 10%, 15%. Once again, go to storypunks.world forward slash candy. All right, so that should be plenty of goodies to get us all set up to enjoy a pretty amazing interview. The last thing I'll ask is that you go to JekyllIslandChronicles.com so you can see some of the visual stuff we're talking about, especially if you're listening to audio only. That's a really cool way to get the vibe that they're creating. And I just couldn't be more excited to share episodes 37 and 38 with you. Here we go. The Jekyll Island Chronicles was created by the Lost Mountain Mechanicals, three working grown-ups, all with families and all with careers, who just decided to do something different. In 2013, we got to work in earnest and engage the help of the Savannah College of Art and Design, which is so cool and innovative. SCAD created a special class for our project and in a -a one-of-a-kind venture, hand-selected 10 students from the School of Sequential Arts to work with us visualizing our story, sketching, inking, and creating concept pages for the series. While they were working, we nailed down the script, fleshed out the characters, and developed the alternate history and the technology of the fantastical world of what is now called the Jekyll Island Chronicles. The books were released by the graphic novel and or comic book powerhouses of Top Shelf and IDW Publishing. So now let me introduce each of the Lost Mountain Mechanicals. Steve Nedvedek, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having us all with you this morning. We're really looking forward to our time together. Absolutely. Steve has worked in film, radio, and television and received his master's degrees in theater from Wake Forest University, where he completed his thesis in makeup design. He is an avid cartoonist, model maker, writer, and movie watcher, and resides in the Atlanta suburbs with his wife, two of three kids, and dog. Ed Crowell, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Thanks, Cindy. It's great to be here with you. Ed Crowell holds advanced degrees in political science and international affairs. He is an executive at a nonprofit and writer with dozens of published articles, a lifelong fan of science fiction and fantasy. He and his wife have two children who went off to college, but left Ed and Cynthia with two cats, a fish and a dog. And your wife has a wonderful name. Yes, she does indeed. Jack Lowe, it's wonderful to have you on the show as well. It's wonderful to be here. I really do appreciate it. Jack is a student of filmmaking and themed entertainment, a passionate storyteller with a bent toward immersive multi-sensory experiences. He and his wife, three children, two dogs, and two cats live in a 150-year-old farmhouse near Lost Mountain in Georgia. So I think we can figure out where the name came from for Lost Mountain Mechanicals. And Lost Mountain Mechanicals, it's so great to have you all together. So as we get started, Let me just remind the audience that we do have a YouTube version of this podcast. And so go check that out so that you can see what I'm about to talk about with them throughout this entire show, especially since it's such a visual medium we're talking about today. But also because I want to ask each of you about the wonderful backgrounds I'm seeing with all this visual art or uh, just things that inspire you in your working space. So let's start with Steve. You have some awesome comic art and all kinds of good stuff there. Yeah, we, uh, we're very um, grateful to have kind of a writer's room that we use uh, in the basement of my house, which has all been decked out with comic books, graphic novels, uh, the old Aurora models that I used to make when I was a kid. It's, it's kind of a, a very strange and geeky, but, you know, fun environment for us. Uh, we've got racks of comic books, racks of mad magazines, 
uh, all of our uh, passes from Comic Con when we'd been there, you know, uh, promoting the book. So it's kind of a great, great uh, room to to work out of. If you can kind of see some of it now, I'm just going to like pan around and let you enjoy some of what we get a chance to enjoy every time we're we're together. Um, so it's just a really, really nice space that allows for all kinds of fun and, uh, creative moments. Thank you so much. Yes. I'm seeing tons of figurines for anyone who can't make it to the video version and is only listening to audio. They have these bright red chairs, tons of comic art and just memorabilia. Like he's just described. It looks. Yeah. We took our old kitchen table and we put, uh, we painted it black and we put, um, comic book wallpaper on it and oh, cool. it, that's the that's the thing that we use to uh to write on so that's the table and yeah so it's there's a lot to see oh so cool thank you so jack do you have anything there i'm seeing a really cool compass um, well, yeah, that's a, that's a compass. Actually, since my wife tried to, to uh, throw a little design into this room. This is just my office at home. Really, when we do our uh, our, our meetings and our writings, we head over to Steve's basement. As you can see, that's that's where you get inspired there for sure. Fantastic. And then, Ed, you mentioned an old, was it a phonograph? Yes. And the, uh, this is my office, and it's where I do some of the writing when we're not together. Um, it's a bit eclectic, but I've got some antiques, uh, family heirlooms, things like that in here. Over my shoulder, you can see an Edison phonograph, yes. um, which, I, which I love and which actually still works. Um, here's some old songs from the early 1900s, things like that. Um, there's a box over there full of Civil War memorabilia and some other things along the lines. Uh, and you can't see it, but there's also an antique typewriter down there that uh, serves as inspiration. Remind me that, you know, at the end of the day, writers have to actually sit down and write. <laughs> there's something about these retro machines that really connects with me when I'm creating as well. So I totally get that. <laughs> Well, it helps. It helps when you're working in in any of the punk genres because you know just the whole retro look comes through, and it's it, it, it kind of inspires you. Oh, it totally does. Okay, so that's a perfect segue. Let's talk about definitions because your work is diesel punk, and also some people might call it steampunk, but you probably all have your own definitions or maybe it's really open for you, but I always like to start here because it's a way of understanding where you came from when you created what you've created. So Steve, we'll start with you. Yeah. I, uh, I have come to realize a lot more than I used to that there are so many different punks <laughs> that, um, that we, we want to make sure that we're, we're actually operating in the in the world that we're that we're living in here. I think when we first got started, we were very much you know labeled as a steampunk kind of genre. In fact, the first time we went to Comic Con and took our cosplay characters with us, um, it was very surprising. They had this um, annual steampunk gathering on top of one of the the roofs there at San Diego, and we showed up and won an award for um, our contribution to steampunk. And we thought, well, this is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> but we're kind of diesel punk. So um, just the, the timing of this technology being, um, you know, in the 1920s and what was going on there with, with Tesla, with Ford, uh, with, you know, Carnegie, uh, with Steinmetz, some of the people that we have incorporated into the book, um, you know, trying to stretch that tech out uh, further than it actually would have been. Um, more the non-commercial um, scientific type of uh, experimental technology that they might've had access to. And there are a lot of things that we found out in the research that were actually kind of coming online then. For example, Henry Ford's personal vehicle, well, bulletproof, bulletproof glass was coming online, uh, see-through glass and uh, I'm sorry, the see-through acrylics and um, things like uh, air conditioning. I mean, those were all early, early, testable things that were going on at that time. So we really like camping out in this uh, period of history. It's so charged with um, possibilities. And Jack and Ed do a really good job of kind of 
keeping us grounded into, you know, what, what is possible and what's actually going on at that time with relation to jet engines and all type of things. Jack, Ed, if you guys want to chime in on that, feel free, please. Yeah, Jack, yeah, well, go for yeah, it. I, um, I think it's okay that, that it can be confused uh, or, or blended or blurred because when you think about technology and you think about fuel, I mean, when I think steampunk and, diesel punk. I'm thinking about the fuel. I mean, steam was the fuel and diesel was the fuel. But, um, you know, that was certainly a time when, well, there's never really a time when one fuel ends and the next year a new fuel begins. Like, I mean, so solar panels right now, everyone doesn't have solar panels right now. We're all still living in, you know, previous earlier types of uh, energy sources. So even in that time, in the early 1900s, um, there was still steam power out there and lots of steam powered machinery was still very prevalent but diesel was coming online. Um, so I think it's perfectly fine that people blur those. Uh, it's just reality. That's the reality we worked in, in our book. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I mean, I think we're transitional punk. We can go a lot of different ways. And there uh, you go. That's good. You know, it, it, it is interesting. I, cause I tend to think of the, of different punks as sort of detours from reality. Um, usually what you've got is the basic idea is, is one particular thing, as Jack said, maybe a fuel, or one particular thing took the place of something else. Um, usually it's electronics. Instead of electronics, you had, you know, clockwork running something or steam running something. Um, in our case, some cases, diesel running something. And it gives us a lot of fun to play with that and exp and, um, and carry the technology. That, what would it look like if you want to do the same thing, but you use a different power source to do it? And that's kind of the basis of getting into a, a punk that is believable when you're doing it. It looks like it could actually work. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, you can see what a good panel this is going to be because these guys have really thought through and they've thought through things that different creators listening to the show will be interested in as well. But first, I want to talk about readers and what emotional or thematic journey new readers of your comic series, The Jekyll Island Chronicles, can expect or look forward to. We'll start with Steve. When we began the process of putting this down uh, to create a graphic novel, we, we actually took some themes and placed them on index cards and, and keep them in the writer's room even now. And we started this in earnest in 2013. Here it is, 2019. And those index cards are still on the door in our room to make sure that we don't stray too much from what we were trying to accomplish, you know, at the beginning of the themes of the ability for people who are from different backgrounds, just to be able to work together. Uh, the theme of believing that, you know, we are actually much better when we are cooperating than when we are um, just alienating uh, each other from ourselves. We, we, we really need to, to focus on that. Um, the need to uh, remember that, you know, America is a place of hope. Um, my, my grandparents that came over before World War I came over because there was, there was hope, there was promise here. And uh, how do we you know, encourage people today to realize that um, there's still hope in their lives and, and things aren't always bleak and dark and cynical as comics have tended to become these days. Um, that was one of the things that we were trying to capture was that we wanted heroes that knew very clearly the, the difference between right and wrong. It didn't mean they were per perfect people at all, but they weren't cynical, dark individuals driven by, you know, internal, um, uh, you know, conflict that was causing them to, you know, be anxious people. Um, they, they were in an anxious enough world because it was, it was very, very fragile at the time. So when I think about the people that came before me and my family, when I think about my grandparents, I think about people that, that, um, that fought. Uh, I think about people that died. I think about people that had a great, good, strong sense of duty. And I think about people that, you know, I would consider to be heroic, uh, in a time such as this. Jack, before we jump to you, I just want to comment that, yes, there are different types of diesel punk and anyone who's listened to this show or been into the genre, they know that there's, there can be like this really dark, heavy, you know, really, really war focused side of it. And then there can also be stuff that incorporates the wartime and, and maybe not even the wartime stuff, but it's lighter and it, it is filled with, you know, some of that deco hope and, and 
all of that. So that's a really important thing to understand about your work. And it sounds like you guys have really defined that and, and there's a, a definite feel or vibe that people can connect with. So what do, let's go to you next, Jack. Yeah, thanks for thanks for noticing that. I think that's where we live in our in our work. Um, yeah, they came literally off the battlefields. These these characters have, and uh, but they're working with people who are building things for a brighter future for the world. So it is a blend of what you just described. I really like that. Um, and as far as what our characters go through, we we remember that they gave so much on the battlefield, um, and then they were called to give more. So. Uh, you know, can our readers be introspective and, and think about themselves in that role? I would hope so. That you know, there's points in their life, their own lives, our own lives, where you know we feel like we've given it all, and then the next day we have to step up and do it again and do hard things again. Our heroes in our comic book are are asked to do that. Um, I hope that there's things to learn from that about ourselves. Oh, so good. Okay, Ed, how about you? I'm not sure I can add much to that. I think they they pretty much got the gist of it. That's totally fine. And I will not, I will change the order sometimes just to anyone listening. So I'm trying to announce each person's name not to belabor that, but just since we have audio listeners, I'll keep doing that. I, I'll try to not be too invasive about it. But Ed, we'll start the next question with you and go in reverse. So um, in chatting with Steve before this interview, he actually mentioned a whole bunch of real life historical figures. And he's already mentioned Steinmetz today. And he talked about like the flying squad in London around the 1920s. So you can either steal these from him and talk about some of them or, you know, direct it his direction because I was speaking with him about it. But where did you come up with this real life historical research? Or, you know, what things do people likely not know about, even though they've been into history and stuff that you just really attached to and put into your story? Oh, that, those are great questions, Cindy. Um, you know, by and large, a lot of the historical figures we deal with are people we learned about in in our history lessons, in our own reading. Uh, all of us are avid readers, not only of sci-fi and things like that, but just everything. Um, biographies and history, history of the United States, so on and so forth. So, you know, we're familiar with them. I mean, Steinmetz was one that that I had remembered from as a small child about what an interesting guy he was, this genius in about a four foot, six inch body and some of the stories surrounding him. Um, you can't do a punk, you know, that era, you can't do anything in that era without bringing Nikola Tesla into it. You know, so you got to have him in the, in the mix. Um, some of the more interesting things I think we learned were some of the events that, um, that none of us knew existed. Um, some of the events we do in our book, and it is an alt history book, which means that it takes detours from, from reality or from real history, but there's a lot of fact involved as well. And uh, we use a lot of real events that actually work nicely to tie into our storyline. Um, but there were actually blimp crashes in Chicago and wall street, uh, you know, mail bombings by terrorists during this time period. And we tend to think it was just all a blank slate back then, but it wasn't. It was full of people living and struggling and, and uh, you know, all the evil we see today still existed then. Um, it found its ways to express itself and the, and the good guys found their ways to battle it. So we get all of that and we find newness in, as we go in and do our research. Oh, thank you. How about you, Jack? Yeah, Ed, Ed is exactly right with some of these events. I mean, it's interesting when we we're writing our story and we know we need something here. Um, the well doesn't run dry in history. We just we do our research and we <laughs> dig around. We we read books. We we're on the internet researching all the time, and something something is discovered that serves it perfectly. Uh, you know, Ed mentioned some of these things like the blimp crash in Chicago. What we'll do then is we'll layer on our punk design aesthetic to that. And we'll enhance the blimp a little bit. In history, we know it was the, you know, the wing, the wing foot owned by the Goodyear company, um, a typical just old blimp. We decide to punk it up a little bit and make it a little cooler. And but we don't change a whole lot of the actual event. And we hope our readers are then inspired to say, oh, that, that I had no idea. I like what y'all have done here. Let me let me research further and find out more about that. We do the same thing with the Flying Squad in London. Yeah, there really was uh, an early test of um getting police officers around London very quickly using the fastest cars they could at the time. We decided to punk up those cars a little bit and a bit, make them a little bit cooler. 
So we, you know, we have a lot of fun doing that for sure. Oh, that's so cool. Cause yes, just a reader is going to be fascinated and wonder which part is real, which part is punked. And then that leads to more research of the actual history, which I love. Very cool. Okay. That's Steve. Yeah. That's what we hope for. Thank Thanks, you. Jack. <laughs> okay. Steve. Yeah. I think that there's um, certainly the, the things that are uh, historical and events that that happened, but there's also a bunch of stuff that didn't happen that they that they contemplated things that they they talked about but actually never really built. Uh, one of the interesting things that we found and we incorporated it in the book too was this thing called the West Jersey Bridge, and it was a design bridge that they were planning on building, uh, and it never got built. But we thought, well, what? Let's take that design. Let's throw it in the book. Um, let's, let's put it on, you know, like page 62 and let's show ships going underneath the fictional West Jersey bridge that didn't exist, but only in somebody's mind. So it wasn't that we, um, created it from scratch. There is so much out there that, um, was just left on the drawing board, so to speak. And we pick up those pieces as well. It didn't actually have to happen. If somebody thought of it, sometimes we incorporate it. That's so cool. Okay. So for anyone creating who doesn't even know where to start finding stuff that never left the drawing board, do you have any tips? And we can strike this if it, this isn't in our notes. So. Well, I, you know, I think, go, I, ahead, go ahead. Ed. Uh, yeah. I, I think um, a great place to start is just to imagine the what if um, or, or what you'd like to see and then go look and research if somebody had, uh, you know, beat you to it or had the idea. Um, our first novel features the Gibraltar tunnel which, you know, has never been built. So we built it for everybody, um, <laughs> you know, it, but it's been talked about for hundred, hundred years or more ever since, um, you know, the colonial period was the idea of connecting Africa and Spain through a tunnel under the Mediterranean. And uh, it became really useful for one of our first action scenes. Um, you know, it's a lot easier to build it when you're writing a book than it is to actually build it in real life. Yeah. But, it's cheaper. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's cheaper and quicker. So. Very cool. Steve, did you yeah, have we, something on that? We have, um, we have helpers too. Uh, my, you know, my family has, they know what we're doing here. And from time to time, I'll, I'll get an email from my oldest son saying, dad, you, you need to take a look at this. Uh, so not only are we scouring around, but others are scouring for us. And uh, he found a very interesting island off the coast of Scotland that um, has these amazing rock formations and this this large cave that we you know inserted into the book, like Ed said, you, you can find so much if you just are curious and you start to look around. Uh, there there is a ton out there. My wife will you know know if I'm sitting there watching television with her and she's you know making a quilt that I'm probably sitting on my iPad scouring for facts, places, events, things that happened, things that didn't really happen because everything contributes to the story. So yeah. can. Just always having your idea front of mind and communicating it with people. This is what I'm working on because then they will probably reach out to you and know, Hey, he might be interested in this or she might be interested in this. So very good. Jack, did you have anything to add? Um, I, I know you were going to ask us a question later about inspiration, but this question you just asked us seemed in the same vein. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I consider everything to be inspiration. Um, you know, I, th I think the worst thing that can happen is when you're, when you are having a writer's block or you're stuck, whatever is to sit at your desk and lament the fact that you're stuck. Yeah. Um, that what you really should do is get out or read or watch a movie or explore something or talk to people because you have to begin cataloging in your head sometimes just everything that you're experiencing everything is everything is possible everything is potential for um to get you out of that writer's block or potential to enhance your story um even things that are you feel are very modern um and wouldn't fit in your time period and that can inspire you too so you just you have to pull yourself out of the the doldrums of being blocked and actually get out and lift up your head and experience the world Oh, it's so good. Great advice. And it's crazy how we get in our rut and we forget 
But I agree, this is a really good transition into that question. So let me ask Ed and Steve if they have anything else to add as far as inspiration or your process. So we'll start with Steve. I think for all of us, uh, just having each other there around the table is inspirational to us. You know, there are, there are any number of half-baked ideas that we all have had. And it's great to have, you know, the, this band of brothers around this writing table. And we've known each other for 20 years. Uh, and our families, you know, have grown up together and the kids have known each other. And, you know, a couple of us have worked at the same place and, you know, we've all gone to the same church and stuff. I mean, we just have gone on vacation together. We, we know each other. And I think that old saying of iron sharpens iron um, may be trite to some, but we find that is absolutely true. Okay, Story Punks, you can probably tell that this is transitioning into the second topic I mentioned at the very beginning of this episode. So when we head into the next episode, episode 38, we're going to talk more about collaboration because we have three experts here. And I was really impressed how it just flowed. It just came out when they were talking about inspiration, my previous question, and then it just automatically turned to collaboration for them. That's really significant. And especially if you are looking to collaborate with other creatives, I hope that this next episode coming right up will help you define what you want from it and how to approach it and help you think of ways to succeed at it because it can be a tricky mix. So with that, let's gear up for the next episode or feel free to break away, of course, and come back and join us next time as you get time. I'm really looking forward to sharing part two of my conversation with the Lost Mountain Mechanicals.